Hello and welcome to Lost Love Chronicles. 10.30 a.m., Friday, Max was still trying to regain strength in his legs. Numb and weak from days of inactivity. It will hurt a bit now, but it will be fine in a few days. Nurse said with a smile. Max grunted and kept on slogging. An hour of therapy left him tired and hungry. Rest up, and we start tomorrow again. The nurse said with a smile and helped Max on the bed. Doctor will be here to see you. Max laid there with his eyes closed and a few minutes later he woke up to a heavy voice calling his name. Dr. Thomas stood there with some papers. How are we feeling this morning, Max? He asked. Much better than yesterday, Max said. The doctor nodded his head and placed some x-rays on the display device so he could see them. After consulting his chart, he turned to Max. I must say, I'm very impressed with your progress, he said. The x-rays show that your ribs are nearly completely healed, as are the fractures on your skull. On top of that, your testicles appear to be almost completely healed and fully functional. I see the swelling on your face is almost gone and the bruising is significantly diminished. Whatever it is you're doing, please keep doing it. At this rate, we might be able to discharge you in just a couple days or so. That's good to hear, Doc, Max said. You mentioned my testicles. How badly were they damaged? That enough that we considered removing them, the doctor said. But like I said, they now seem to be almost completely healed. Tell me, overall, how much pain are you feeling, on a scale of 1 to 10, with 1 being the least, and 10 the worst? Overall, I'd say about 2 or so, Max said. Good, the doctor said, making a note in his chart. We'll keep an eye on things for a bit, and I'll adjust your medications accordingly. You just rest, and get well, okay? Do you have any questions for me before I leave? Max went silent, he stared at the doctor for 2 minutes, I guess not. I have heard this before, discussion about my injuries, unexpected recovery, discharge, rating my pain. I have heard this before. Max was confused and a sharp pain drove through his head. Was it a dream? That woman, Adrestia, Nemesis, the goddess, Eli the warrior, was it all real? Nah, just my mind playing games. Max closed his eyes, tried to make sense of it all. Soon, he fell asleep. Trying to find me, Max. There she was, Adrestia my love, she was right there in front of me. No, it's an illusion. Wake up, Max. She is not real. Danny Jones will meet you tomorrow. You know what to do, the sweet voice whispered in his ears. Max woke up, all shaken. Danny Jones, I have heard that name. She is an attorney. But how will she know me? Why will she help me? All these thoughts, oh the pain, it's back. Max closed his eyes and tried to calm down. Next morning, after his exercise session, the nurse helped Max to his bed. A few minutes later she returned. There is a woman who wants to meet you. She says her name is Danny Jones and says that it is very important. Please send her in, Max interjected the nurse. Danny entered the room and stood near Max and placed her hand on his chest and said, I was told you wanted to meet me and discuss something urgent. How did you know that I wanted to meet you? Max asked. I was contacted by your assistant. I missed her name but she said it was urgent and you wanted to file for a divorce. What happened between you and your wife? Max was silent and shocked. He does not have any assistant, and no one knew there were issues between him and his wife. Who is this woman who called Danny? He decided to play along and use this opportunity to do what he intended, divorce his wife. Max explained everything, his wife cheating on him, Jake and his lackey wanting him to clean up their accounts, the icing on the cake, his $10 million assets that he does not want to share with his wife. It seems that you have the gods watching you closely. Broken bones healing in record time your testicles not being amputated, your fractured skull completely healed. You are the miracle man, Mr. Burns. However, given the circumstances, it would be advisable if you get a discharge and go underground. I believe your wife would benefit from your demise. I will arrange for a friend of mine to help you with it. As for your divorce, do you have a personal lawyer or do you want me to file for your divorce? Saul, my attorney can help with the divorce, but I do need to get out of here and would appreciate all the help I can get. Max responded. Danny sat next to Max and went over the paperwork. They spent about an hour going over everything, and when Danny felt the paperwork was complete, she sat back. Okay, she said. I'll get with your attorney on this and we'll get it done. She handed Max's cell phone. How did you get my phone? Max asked. Your secretary sent it over in an envelope. Max took the phone and dialed Saul. Max, how are you feeling? His lawyer asked when he answered. I'm doing much better, Saul. Thanks for asking, Max said. Listen, I need a huge favor from you. Anytime, my friend, Saul said. What's going on? Well, 
It's rather complicated, and I really don't want to get into it over the phone, Max said. I need some things done, quickly, and I've got someone on her way over to see you, a Danny Jones. I'd like you to work with her to expedite some things for me. Ah, uh, yes, I remember her, Saul said. She's the one who took a huge bite out of Acme, if I recall. If she's involved, it must be serious. More than I can tell you right now, Max said. I've signed all the papers and I've given permission for her to work with you on my behalf. Okay, Max, Saul said. I'm in the middle of something at the moment, but I should be free about one o'clock or so. I'll call the office and let them know to expect her. Max looked at Danny before speaking. Is one o'clock good for you? He asked her. She nodded her head and he turned his attention back to the phone. One o'clock is good. She'll be there. I appreciate all your help. Saul chuckled. Just wait till you get my bill, he said with a laugh. Max laughed as well. They ended the call. Saul Dunitz will be expecting you at one o'clock, he said. Do you know where his office is? Yes, I do, and I'll be there, she said, standing up. I'd better get going. I'd like a bite to eat before I meet with him. It's good to meet you, Max, she added, extending her hand. Max shook her hand and watched as she left. A few seconds later, Max was left thinking it was all the same, just like my dream. Just two people were missing from the room. Everything else was just the same. Max looked at his phone and then looked out of the window of his room. His mind was racing. He closed his eyes and held the phone near his chest. He looked at the phone and his fingers started typing. His felt his mind blank. He could see that he is typing something, but he was not commanding his fingers. It felt that they had a mind of their own. He tried to control them and stop, but he could not. What is happening to me? His fingers stopped. He looked at the screen and was shocked. It read, I agree to do Mario's books. Assistant will meet you at Four Seasons Restaurant at 6 p.m. Bring everything. Don't look for her. She'll find you. Okay. What about my demands? Shannon responded. You'll get what's coming to you. Why did I type all this? I did not want to do anything with her. I just wanted to get away. Max suddenly felt another wave of pain taking over his body. His body went limp. His eyes could see, but his body could not move. Then he saw her. A dresser was standing over him. Her white robe was flowing, and it seems that she was hovering in air. Max smiled, or he thought he did. Eli will be here. Go with him. He will get you where you need to be. Be prepared for what is about to come and never lose hope. I am always with you and I will always love you. She came down and kissed him on his lips. A sudden jolt woke up Max. He was still holding on to his phone, but he could still feel the warmth of the kiss on his lips. Max fell asleep the same way. That evening the nurse came as informed Max that he is ready for a discharge and there is someone to pick him up. She helped Max in a wheelchair and assisted him to the tall man standing in the lobby to pick him up. Max knew that face, he saw him in his dreams, it was Eli. Before Max could say anything, he raised his hand and said, We have a long way ahead and we can talk on the way. Max got up from his wheelchair and walked out with him. As they drove by, there was a crowd standing by and looking at medical staff loading two bodies in an ambulance. Did you really kill them? Max asked Eli. Well, I just tried some moves that I saw on TV. I did not know it will kill them. So, the dreams are real. You are real. Adrestia is real. Max said in a low tone. Don't rush on it, kid. Not everything that you see in your dream will come to life. Some of the things do come true, but a lot of that does not. All of that depends on your actions. Eli said. So, the dreams are just a trailer. The actual movie might be different. Max questioned. In case you chicken out, nothing that you see will matter. So to check if you are the real deal and not a chicken, you must go through a test. What test? I don't know. It just happens and at times you just might not know if you went through it and passed. You do get to know for sure if you fail. In your case, I guess you have passed and that is why you are going to the dungeon. The dungeon? Max asked. Well, it's called Camp Rollins, but I call it the dungeon. It gives an extra level of machismo to it. It's a facility to train you and get you ready. I saw it in my dreams and passed it successfully. I bet you did. Everyone does. In their dreams. Max and Eli took a flight to Spokane and in a few hours were standing in front of Camp Rollins. This is as far I can take you. You need to go ahead on your own now. Best of luck and I hope you don't chicken out. A word of advice. Choose your fights wisely. You don't need to fight everyone and at times your enemies will dig their own graves. Eli then handed Max an external hard drive. They will teach you how to decrypt it and you will decide how to use it. Your beloved wife has given this. She wanted you to fix all her wrongs. We have already disabled the tracker and worked through the encryption on the files. And I got rid of the virus they put on the drive. 
Max took the drive and went inside. The first month of camp was rough on Max, but he expected it. They ran everywhere, up and down steep hills, through obstacle courses that included rope climbs into tall trees, and to the gym, where they worked out with weights until their arms could hardly move. They were given exercises that made little sense to him at the time. These workouts took place every day from 5 a.m. until 6.30 p.m. That was the time they returned from dinner and were allowed to have one cigarette in a formation outside their barracks. The only other break the students got was on Sundays. Those who wished went to church. The rest were given jobs around the camp, mowing the grass or washing laundry. That was also the day they were allowed to write letters. Max had no one to write to and no one sent him any letters. He worked only on the drive given to him. The camp authorities did give him a laptop to work with. That is the only thing he did in his spare time. He gathered all the evidence and found it was a treasure trove of multitude of crimes, illegal guns, drugs, human trafficking, graft, pay-for-play, you name it. It also had transactions with a number of elected officials across the country. Bank details, amounts, and phone numbers. Prisons are going to be full, I guess, he said to himself. Meanwhile, 1,500 miles away, Shannon and Jake were beside themselves trying to get a lock on Max's location. Shannon was even more concerned, given that she handed over the drive to his assistant. She still hated the tall blondie. Max must be sleeping with her. That which will pay. Once I get my hands on Max, I will take out that witch. She was still concerned when it came to Max. He needs to be here, so she can take away his money. She thought it odd that she never heard from him. No texts, no calls, no emails, nothing. Nevertheless, all their bills were being paid and she received a weekly stipend, which she spent on food and other things she needed. She began to wonder if maybe Jake and Mario had taken him out. She broached the subject to Jake a couple times, but he shut her down. As for the updates on Mario's books, all they received were anonymous emails saying they were being processed. When they tried responding, all they got were error messages saying the address they attempted to contact did not exist. What they didn't know is that enough information had already been forwarded to certain agencies who were preparing to make some big arrests. Max finally got to the third month of his training and found that he enjoyed the close combat and self-defense training he received. Of course, the physical training and psychological counseling continued. They also offered him free legal help, but he turned that down since he already had an attorney working his case. Then came the burn the witch ceremony, which marked the end of their training. The instructors gathered them outside after dinner around a pole that had a pile of wood around it. A straw figure lay on the ground next to it. When I give the command, take one photo of your spouse and pin it to the figure, their senior instructor commanded. Ready? Move. They all pulled a photo of their spouse and pinned it to the figure. All Max had was a photo he got from the PI that showed both Shannon and Jake. He stabbed a pin through Shannon's face, securing the photo to the figure. Not the figure, the instructor ordered. They picked up the straw effigy and tied it securely to the pole. Vintage. Front and center, the sergeant ordered. Max stepped in front of the sergeant, who handed him a lit torch. He grabbed the torch with both hands and held tight. Burn the witch, the sergeant ordered. Sir. Burn the witch. Aye. Aye, sir. Max shouted in response. He walked to the pile of wood below the straw effigy and set it on fire. The flames licked up, catching the straw figure on fire. Burn. 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 They all chanted as flames devoured the straw figure. The photos quickly curled up and burned to ash. Burn. 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 The men shouted, pumping their fist in the air. They continued to chant and pump their fist in the air. The chants turned into howls and angry growls as the figure burned. The men sounded more like wild animals than human beings as they howled. Soon, the figure fell off the pole and burned as it lay on the ground. A few of them unzipped their trousers and urinated on the figure. Max joined them. The sergeant gave everyone a beer from a chest at his feet and they celebrated the end of their training. Max joined several others and lit up a cigarette to go with his beer. The next morning, Max got up and followed the rest of the class into the head where he showered, shaved, and got ready for the day. After getting dressed in freshly laundered jeans and denim shirts, the class went to breakfast, retrieved the stuff they turned in, then formed up for the graduation. The camp commander and the senior instructor stood before them. You men have come a long way since you arrived, the camp commander said. You came here, scared, uncertain about your future, defeated and humiliated by the ones you love the most. Now, you've gotten your manhood back. You look like men with the confidence to take on the world. You have the tools and the wherewithal to take on and successfully complete whatever you set out to do. 
I wish the best for each one of you. Remember, we're here for you 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. If you need anything, anything at all, even someone to talk to, we're here for you. Now, go and take on the world. Their senior sergeant stood in front of the class. Class, attention. Dis. Missed. The men hooped as they picked up their bags and headed to the bus, stopping to shake the sergeant's hand. Many of them gathered before entering the bus to exchange contact information, promising to stay in contact with each other. Max headed to the airport and saw Eli waiting for him. He walked up to him and shook his hand. You look better, kid. I guess they fed you well. Yep, they did. It was tougher than I thought. But I survived. Max laughed. On the flight, Max and Eli were seated together. Max asked, In one of my recent dreams I got a power of making people do my will. Do I get that power in real life? How do I know I have that power? Eli smiled and said, You never know until you use it. Time will tell. A few hours later they came out of the airport. You should know that Shannon, Jake, and some of Mario's boys are at your house, Eli said. Amos is with the private investigator keeping an eye on things. I'm told there's some sheriff's deputies with them. You gonna be able to handle this? Eli asked. Max took a deep breath and let it out slowly. I'm ready to get this done. Eli nodded. Not having any luggage, the two of them went outside and flagged down a cab. Before they got in, though, a young man on a skateboard came zipping down the sidewalk, bowling over a woman pushing a baby stroller. Hey, you. Max ordered. The teenage boy on the skateboard stopped and turned to Max. Are you talking to me? The teenager asked. Max took in the ring he wore in his nose and upper lip. Yeah, you Max said. Get over here and apologize to this woman. Now, he ordered. The kid just flipped his middle finger at Max and walked away. Eli started laughing and said, I guess that power is still manifesting. Max stood there and looked at Eli. Yep, I guess I need to wait. Eventually, they made their way to Max's house, which sat on a five-acre wooded lot on the edge of town. They came upon a pickup that Eli recognized. He asked the driver to pull over for a second. The driver pulled over and Amos came to the cab. There's four fellas inside with Mrs. Burns and her lawyer friend, he said. Process server and sheriff's deputies are here with arrest warrants for all of them. Okay, Eli said. Follow us inside. Amos nodded his head and walked back to the deputies on the other side of the road. Eli gave the signal for the driver to pull into Max's property. Max paid the driver with his credit card and got out of the vehicle. Eli got out on the other side. He directed the others to follow close behind him and waved the cab driver off. After the cab left the property, Max, Eli, Amos, the process server and two deputies went to the front door while a third deputy went behind the house to enter from the back door. Max opened the door and walked in. The four goons turned and began to pull out their weapons. Max moved fast and landed quick blows on the four goons and knocked them out to Shadowland. He walked in and saw Shannon and Jake sitting in the living room. The process server walked up to Shannon and handed her the divorce papers. Miss Shannon Burns, you have been served. She took the papers in her hand. Max walked up to Jake and held him by his throat and looked straight in his eyes. He let him go, walked a step back and punched right on his nose. It broke with a cracking sound and Jake went down on the ground and held it with his hands. Shannon, there is a pin on the table, sign the papers. Max said, No, you are not getting away that easy. She shot back. Max picked up Jake and looked towards Eli. Eli handed him a baton. Max took it and landed a swift blow to his left knee. The room filled with Jake's scream, and he fell to the floor. So, Shannon, are you signing the papers? No, her voice shaking. Max placed his foot at Jake's right ankle and landed another blow on Jake's right knee. Jake screamed, just sign the damn papers which. He will kill me. Shannon was on her knees by now shaking and quickly signed the papers. Max felt a hand on his shoulder. He looked back to see a dressed as shadow. But he felt something in him, something growing, something in his throat. Max looked at Shannon and Jake. The cops will be here and they will arrest you. You will cooperate in the investigation and will answer all questions honestly. Do I make myself clear? Their eyes looked blank and they nodded. Eli waked up to Max and said, I guess your power just manifested. Cops soon walked in and arrested both Shannon and Jake. Two days later, Max and Eli stood outside Mario's penthouse. A big man was guarding the door. Max walked up to him and politely said, You need to let me in. The man opened the door and closed it once Max and Eli entered. Soon they were standing near the pool deck. Mario was in a deep conversation with his lawyer. Who are you? Mario asked as he stood up. Yes, the lawyer said. 
Speak up, man. Who are you? And how did you get here? Don't you recognize the accountant you wanted to do your books? You really should know who you're doing business with, Mario, Max said. What? Mario asked. What are you talking about? I'm the guy Jake and Shannon told you about, Max said. Oh, so you're the accountant who double-crossed me, Mario said. Do you know who you're dealing with? Do you realize I can have you taken out with a single call? Max chuckled. The real question is, do you know who you're dealing with? Max said. Mario took a step back. He wasn't used to people standing up to him. He considered his options before speaking. All right, Mario said. You've got my attention. Now, tell me what I need to do to make things right with you. You do know that even if the feds come after me, I'll never spend a minute behind bars. My lawyers will keep the courts tied up in knots for years. So, tell me what it is you want. Money? I got lots of it. Women? I've got more than I can shake a stick at. You can have some of it. As much as you want. Just name your price. Max felt his face turn red with anger. Deep down, he knew that Mario was right. Even though he deserved to spend the rest of his life in prison, he knew Mario's attorneys would fight tooth and nail to keep him out. And he would be free, free to ruin more lives and free to prosper off the ruin he left behind. There was nothing remotely redeeming about this creature, and Max knew he had to be eliminated. There's only one thing you can do that would satisfy me, Max said. Name it, Mario said. Anything. Max smiled, but there was no warmth in his smile. Drop dead, Max commanded. Mario began to smile, but the smile faded and he brought a hand to his chest. He gasped for air, but was unable to breathe. He looked at Max one last time before his eyes rolled up. He fell to the concrete, his eyes glazed over in death. The lawyer looked at Max, shocked. Who are you? He asked. Max Benich, Max told him. And as far as you're concerned, I don't exist. I was never here. Understand? Why? Yes, I understand, the lawyer stammered. Good, now, go to sleep. And when you wake up, you won't remember a thing. The lawyer dropped to the concrete, his eyes closed in a deep slumber. Max and Eli walked out of the house back to Max's place. While Maz was busy opening the lock on the front door, Eli said, My work here is done, and looking what I see, you don't need me. Goodbye, Max. Max turned back, and there was no one. Eli disappeared into thin air. By now Max was accustomed to see people disappear. Max then slept for a whole day. When he woke up, he turned on the TV, his attention was drawn to a report about Mario. This just into eyewitness news, the anchor said. Reputed mob boss Mario Alvarez was found dead in his New York home. According to the coroner, he suffered an aneurysm and bled out internally. Authorities say his attorney was found in a deep sleep near Alvarez's pool and had no recollection of the incident. Alvarez and his organization came under intense scrutiny after federal authorities received files regarding his alleged activities from an anonymous source. In related news, a local attorney with ties to Alvarez was found dead in his cell. Prison authorities say the man, who has yet to be identified, appears to have committed suicide. A woman who was arrested with the attorney also appears to have suffered a panic attack and is currently being held for observation. Stay tuned to Eyewitness News for more updates. Max chuckled as he turned the television off. A few minutes later, he heard a knock on his door. Looking through the peephole, he saw Detective Hansen and opened the door. Good morning, Detective. What can I do for you? You have a minute? Hansen asked. Sure, come on in. I was just curious to know if you can tell us anything about what happened with your wife and her attorney friend. Max shook his head. No, I can't tell you anything. I haven't spoken to her since she was taken into custody. Maybe you can tell me what happened. Hansen shrugged his shoulders. I really don't know how to describe it. Your wife said something about seeing creatures in her cell overnight. She was pretty hysterical. They had to sedate her and put her in the psych ward of the jail. Did she confess to what she had done? Max asked. She did more than that. All of the perps we picked up sang like canaries. It's going to take us weeks to get through everything they confessed. You don't know anything about that, do you? I advised them to confess everything they could. Nothing wrong with that. Is there? No. I guess not. By the way, you're looking much better than you did the last time I saw you. Thanks, detective. It's amazing what three months in the country can do for you. I guess. So, you have nothing else to offer? Max shook his head. Not a thing, detective. Hansen nodded his head. Okay, he said, preparing to leave. Call me if you can think of anything. Of course. He escorted the detective to the door, shook his hand, and closed the door after he left. After he watched the detective drive off, he went into his home office and sat at his computer. He pulled up Word and Excel and began typing, making entries in the spreadsheet as he went. 
He worked for hours, stopping only to grab something to eat. When he finished, he sat back and looked over his work. Smiling to himself, he stepped on his back deck with a cup of tea and one of Eli's cigarettes. Bunnage agency, he thought to himself. He liked the sound of that. He repeated it to himself a few times, liking the name even more. He took a long drag of his cigarette and heard a quiet female voice in his mind. Cheaters beware, he heard a dress just say in his mind as clear as if she was right next to him. He thought about it for a bit with a smile on his face. He nodded his head in agreement and repeated to no one in particular. Cheaters beware. Max now an angel of vengeance will be back with another tale. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comments section below and don't forget to like, share and subscribe.